Thanks. Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. We're excited to be providing you with an inside look into the Fundamental Crypto Asset Score Rating System, which we will be referring to as FCAST for short, with two very special guests, Dave Balter and Eric Stone from Flipside Crypto. For those of you who are tuning into your first Digital Currency Group Tech webinar, I'm Casey Taylor, the VP of Network, or as I like to say, the keeper of all things community here at DCG. For those of you who may not be totally familiar, Digital Currency Group is best known as the most active and prolific investor in the blockchain and crypto industry. Having made early stage investments into more than 140 of the world's leading crypto companies, we really pride ourselves on our expansive network, our insights, and our access to capital. So in an effort to highlight some of the greatest minds in our portfolio, we launched this series of webinars a little over a year and a half ago to bring a broader community into the conversations that we feel very privileged to have on a daily basis with our founders. Um, so before I turn things over to Dave and Eric, I'll go over a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. For all participants on the line, know that you're currently muted, but there are questions, sections, in the GoToWebinar panel. It may be labeled as chat, it may be labeled as questions, depending on which version of GoToWebinar that you're using. But through that panel, we'll be monitoring all of your questions and we'll be peppering them in throughout the presentation. If you have a more complex question or a multi-part question, we're also happy to unmute you so that you can speak directly with our presenters. Just give me, Casey, permission if you're interested in this option. And for those of you dialing in who may not have access to the panel, uh, perhaps you're just calling in through your phone, you can also email questions to Casey at dcg.co. That's C-A-S-E-Y at D as in David, C as in Charlie, G as in Greg, dot C-O. And with that, I believe we have what we need to get started. Dave, Eric, I'll let you take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much, Casey. Okay, so on January 29th, 2019, Apple released its Q4 2018 quarterly earnings. Apple had achieved 1.4 billion installed devices. Their flagship product, iPhone, its sales had unfortunately declined by 15%. But the good news, all of their products in their product line had increased by 19% for the quarter. Apple execs, after disclosing these in, this information, then went on to describe some of their product initiatives for the future and importantly, how they were gonna impact revenue, growth, and continued earnings. In what is now a tradition for quarterly earnings calls, they described their business in terms we all understand. They spoke about customers, products, growth, earnings. Public companies provide this information because they are truly the foundations for success. And yet, crypto projects to date have not been held to the same standard. Uh, we use terms in this industry like decentralized, protocol, foundation, and they seem to be overlooking some of the main objectives of maybe what these organizations need to do to succeed. Now, I don't want to devalue the, all the efforts that have been happening so far. Yes, the blockchain technology that's been created is, in, is entirely revolutionary. And yes, we remove the untrusted third party from the equation or the trusted third party. And, and sure, we've broken down geographic boundaries by creating global governance standards. All these things have, are incredibly valuable, but they can't serve as an excuse. Here's the reality check. Nothing succeeds without customers and revenue. And for crypto projects, we often like to tell them they need to think of themselves this way in order to survive, and certainly in order for this industry to truly transform the world to meet the objectives that have been set out before us. Simply put, crypto projects are a business, and that may be hard to think of in some of the philosophies and the structures that have been put in front of them, but if they don't begin thinking of themselves this way, they're gonna have a long road ahead for themselves. So today, we're gonna shine a light on some of the data that can be used to help crypto organizations think of themselves as a business and how they might wanna begin moving forward. So a bit of background before we get to that. Uh, this is Dave, I'm, I'm the guy on the left, the CEO, Dave Balter. Uh, this is a, a seventh startup for me. Uh, to my right in the room and, and on the screen is uh, Eric Stone, 
who leads our data science initi initiatives over here. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. And our third co-founder in this business is uh, Jim Myers. He's not on the call today, but uh, Jim is a wonderful uh, engineer, uh, has a large uh, background in data. He's, he's won a few trophies in his day, as we, as we like to tell him. Um, what's important is that three of us have worked together a few times. Um, the last time we built a company together was in uh, 2010. Uh, it was a company called Smarter, which we uh, focused on a, a system for uh, machine learning, using machine learning to evaluate skills in the marketplace. Um, that company was acquired in 2014 by Pluralsight, um, which went public last year. So this team has a long history of working together, building data tools and data products. Um, Flipside Crypto, we began in early 2017, um, focusing on um, thinking about the data that might be useful in the space of crypto. Um, we're backed by a number of wonderful investors, Digital Currency Group, who's hosting this call, but Coinbase Ventures, True Ventures, um, Castle Island, a number of others you can see here. So what are we doing here today? Um, we set out when we began this business really to crack the code on thinking about data and cryptocurrency, and the goal was to really demystify and characterize the world's crypto assets. Um, the reason we sort of headed into this frame was we, like many of you, have probably um, seen this as the way to value the industry, um, a uh, sort of market cap price-oriented uh, philosophy uh, which allowed people to say which of these cryptocurrencies are working or not working. Now, this, this isn't surprising. These have been the most visible insights available. Um, and frankly, if you're an investor in this space, it's a pretty easy way to tell whether you've done good or bad. Um, what we decided pretty early was this was a, a pretty um, pretty ineffective proxy for actually understanding whether these organizations were growing as businesses. And so we began measuring cryptocurrencies through our, what we consider fundamentals in this space. And there's really three major buckets. Um, bucket one is developer behavior, and we're gonna talk about that. Bucket two is user activity. Uh, one of the most complex uh, data sets we work with, and we're going to talk about how we get to that. And the third is market maturity and evaluation of asset efficiency, and we're going to go deep into that shortly. So um, what we do uh, when we begin aggregating this information is we uh, capture thousands of data points across those three parameters. We build factors between them to leverage uh, their interdependencies. Sorry, I'm going backwards. Hold on. And we end up developing a single, uh, consistently comparable index value we call FCAS. Uh, FCAS stands for Fundamental Crypto Asset Score. Um, FCAS is now utilized um, across about 515 or so assets. And what's important about, about this for a moment, just to consider as we get into this, is um, every asset that is rated in our ecosystem is relative meaning you can understand where an asset sits or cryptocurrency sits next to every other cryptocurrency at any point in time. Uh, so you can see them sort of next to each other. All right. Some of you may have, have seen us uh, on CoinMarketCap. We launched there about a month ago. If you go about halfway down a uh, CoinMarketCap listing page and you click the ratings tab in the middle, you will see a historical uh, a picture of that cryptocurrency's FCAS rating over time. Um, you have, may have also seen uh, FCAS on a number of other sites, Market Watch, The Street, Stock Twits. Um, over the next few weeks and months, you're going to see FCAS in uh, dozens of other locations where you might find information on uh, cryptocurrency valuations. So with that, I'm actually going to hand it to Eric to describe a bit about the scoring system, and then we're going to get deep into how we get to this type of data. But not too deep. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so before I go through this little widget, I just want to emphasize something that Dave sort of called out, but I like to, I like to take a pause here and emphasize that FCAS is, in fact, quantitative. Um, yes, it's based on the assumption that Dave laid out that our framing of the crypto space makes some sense, but ultimately the resulting scores are based on the outputs of algorithms and models and not reflective of personal opinions that we or may not have about the projects that we're reading. So I just I like to call that out before we dig into the, 
actual calculation of this stuff and looking at how we display it. Um, what we have on the screen here is what we call the spectrum widget, which shows for any asset that we uh, that we rate, it shows um, a bunch of core aspects of Outcast that you can see labeled. The ones I like to call out are, you can see really clearly here that all of our scores are in a zero to a thousand scale. We call out where the highlighted asset falls on that scale with a few comparables. So you can see Bitcoin against Ethereum, Zcash, and ZeroX here. Um, you can really clearly see its rank. Um, we have ABC, um, then we have an F for fragile and an S for superb. Um, there are very few that hit that S category. I think right now there are maybe two. Um, so just let that sink in for a moment. If you want to go play around with these widgets, you can actually browse every asset that we rate at this URL, app.flipsidecrypto.com slash scores. So feel free to play around there and look at some of the scores. Um, just, to, just to sort of um, take home that point about the distinction between a sort of qualitative analyst um, uh, approach to evaluating a cryptocurrency versus our quantitative approach. You see Tron here as one of the top six assets, and we get, a, we get asked about Tron in particular a lot. Um, and in fact, many of us at Flipside personally don't necessarily believe that Tron is the ultimate future of crypto, but frankly, they have a lot of developers working on it. Um, pretty consistently. They have a big community of developers who are working on it. They have a lot of users. They have a lot of DAP developers. Um, and they have a fairly robust market. You can get into and out of the coin um, easily if you want to. So it hits all of, the, all of the boxes that you need to check to have a high FCAS score. So that's, that's why Tron score is high. And if it turns out that over time those stats dip, then its FCAS score will dip as well. So now that we've covered the, the sort of overall um, display of these assets, we're gonna dive into the three scores and how we calculate them. The first major score is developer behavior, which is getting at that core question of, can you deliver a product to your users? So the way we get at this is by, um, is by gathering data from uh, from code repositories, mostly from GitHub. I say mostly because we do actually monitor repositories on GitLab and Bitbucket as well. Um, but so our, our model for developer behavior um, falls into a general approach that we try to follow at Flipside for building models and algorithms. Um, I want to call that out before we dig into this particular algorithm. It applies to everything we do. First, we, we attempt to truly understand the data before we even try and model it. So we're very rigorous about spending a lot of time visualizing our data, looking for evidence of important characteristics like interactions, correlations, nonlinearity, multicollinearity, all that fun stuff that you learn about in your statistics PhD program. Um, and then once we've looked at that and understand it, we can start to figure out which models make sense for characterizing the data that we're looking at. We don't necessarily just throw the fanciest machine learning algorithm that you've heard of um, at every data set. That's not to say we don't use those fancy algorithms, but I like to say if you can't see anything with a straightforward model after a thorough exploratory analysis, then there's probably nothing to see. So back to our model for developer activity. Um, the, the model that we ended up settling on after that exploratory analysis has three core components that reflect code contributions. So that's actual changes to the code base, um, community involvement, things like watches, forks, comments, number of different contributors, um, that falls into that second category. And then the third is code improvement. So issue resolution, things like major product releases, those kinds of metadata fall into that. These three scores wrap up into a single developer behavior factor score that's also scored from zero to a thousand for every asset. Um, and it sort of may seem simple on its face, but in looking at it, we found it to be an extremely accurate way to monitor and compare the current amount and type of work going on in a project in a really straightforward mechanism. We've even also seen that it's frequently a leading indicator of major changes coming to those projects and even um, for future changes in price if those major changes result in changes to the user behavior. Um, one example uh, from today, subscribers to our daily mover emails, which you can subscribe to on our website if you want to get in on that, highlighted um, Eternity or AE as having a spike in their user activity, which is currently attributed to a lot of repositories that had been stagnant on their GitHub, on their GitHub page 
for many months, they're now seeing a bunch of new activity. We're, we're gonna we're gonna show some of that activity in a bit yeah. here. Okay, so you'll see that in one of the demos. All right, so that's that's developer activity. Let's turn now to user activity, the second major component of AppCast. The idea here is that in order to be a successful project, you need customers. So you see the picture here, the Salesforce user conference, they have customers. It illustrates that in order to be successful, you have to know your customers, you have to know what they're doing. So the key for user activity is answering two questions. Is there activity on your network? And more importantly, how much of that activity can be attributed to real users? That's an easy question for me to ask, um, but it turns out to be an extremely difficult question to answer. Um, and to do it, we've spent hundreds of hours parsing, cleaning, storing data from multiple blockchains, and then hundreds more hours scrutinizing that data to understand the types of behaviors displayed in the millions of different events and transactions that occur over these different systems into a way that allows us to, uh, to assign each transaction and address to one of um, roughly 16 use cases. So we've built out those use cases through a combination of building a ground truth with transaction labels from our own analysis, augmented with third-party data. We track our own wallet transactions and pathways through different exchanges, smart contract systems, UTXO-style currencies, and we build this classification system that enables us to tease apart, ultimately, what is a, speculate, a speculation activity or, or a trade activity and what is actual usage. So this is sort of the most complex thing that we do and also, ultimately, the most valuable thing that we do. So that's user activity. Finally, the, the third component um, we call market maturity. Market maturity has the smallest impact on FCAS overall, but we still believe that a healthy public market is a very important part of a successful project. If your users cannot reliably trade the token or coin that supports the project, they're ultimately not going to be able to fully embrace or adopt the underlying technology. So our market maturity score reflects both risk in the market and relative liquidity of each asset that we're tracking. Those underlying scores are based on a few different perspectives at measuring this. So one tracks the relative performance of about 40 automated swing trading algorithms as a proxy for price reliability. We also track the volatility of prices on the open markets. Um, we, we track exchange liquidity and major shifts in the velocity and supply bands of each project. We'll get into supply bands a bit later. So we, we call this the rudder. And the reason we call it the rudder, it is less than 5% of FCAS. Uh, but it is um, it is sort of a balancer, and and um, with all the data we're collecting, we'd like to think of this type of speculation as important to the health of an asset because many crypto projects still use their token as a form of cash flow, uh, and so that's probably the closest you will get to some form of uh, credit rating in this space. So we we leave it in. It is a very light element. We continue to focus most of our time on those modules for user activity and developer behavior. So I'm gonna um, now switch out here so I can show you some live stuff. Um, so hold on one hey, second. Eric, as you're, yeah. as you're getting that set up, a couple of questions have come in and I think it might be helpful to just revisit um, a few items that you just touched on. So the first came from a, a participant named Max. Uh, he was asking whether the learning is supervised or, or unsupervised. And then uh, we also had a question from Raju uh, just about the Tron analogy. If you could kind of go back to the basics and give us a quick summary before moving on to the next section, that would be great. Okay. Sure. So to answer the first question, um, we, depending on the scoring that we're doing or the data that we're looking at, we use both unsupervised and supervised models. Um, so in the developer behavior example, um, we use an unsupervised approach to find clusters of variables that correlate with each other. So that's one of many types of models we're using there. Um, on the uh, tagging user activity uh, problem, we're using some supervised modeling because we have a ground truth that we're using to identify uh, addresses and transaction types that we know to be of a certain type. So hopefully that gives you an example. So we're, we're not, uh, you know, limiting ourselves to, to unsupervised or supervised approaches. We use you know, traditional statistical models, machine learning models, supervised and unsupervised, depending on the problem. Uh, the second question was, was about Tron. 
Um, and I think my, my point <laughs> here was Tron has, has now surpassed zero X. So it's moved into number three uh, uh, since we began, uh, not today, but since we wrote up the presentation. So that gives you, gives you a little insight. Yeah. Right. So, so the thing with Tron and, and really with EOS too, is that these projects have some of the most robust developer communities we've seen um, in any crypto asset. You know, they, they have a lot of resources and they have a lot of development activity and they're working on a lot of stuff and building new products. And they've actually proven to be fairly effective at that. They've launched their own mainnets and they've attra attracted a lot of developers onto their platforms. You can argue with us about whether the development on those platforms is worthwhile or interesting um, or mainly just gambling tokens. But the fact remains that there is a user base for those and the developers are using those platforms. So that's that's why they have high scores is because of that activity. Okay, if you go, by the way, if you see the URL up here, um, you can go to this uh, page on our site anytime and see uh, all of the coins we rate in this widget and um, they go all the way down. So you can see all 500 on this page or you can see them on CoinMarketCap or other places like that. So let's let's dive a bit more deeply. And Casey, other questions before we move on from here? Nope, I think that we're settled up for now, but I'll let you know if there's okay. any more that come in. Okay, great. So we're oh, gonna we're I'm, gonna. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, of course, everyone starts pouring in questions. Um, so just two quick ones. Um, one. The question is, when is it appropriate to give developer involvement so much weight? Um, and, and the second one is just whether or not developer activity can be fake. So how are you guys thinking about how it's weighted and, and how to ensure that, that it's real? Right. So before, I'll, I'll answer a part of the first one, and then Eric will take over from a statistical perspective. Um, we spend a lot of time um, ensuring that um, our uh, our methodologies uh, can't be gamed. Um, there's some obvious things we do to do that. Um, as an example, we don't uh, utilize any information from communities like Telegram channels uh, or Discord uh, because or Reddit because much of that is able to be easily manipulated to, you know, grow a community or to, you know, suggest otherwise. And so, you know, there are things we do that you know, we, we believe we believe communities are amazing, but if they can be gamed, we just can't include it in, in our rating system. Um, when you get to uh, stuff like developer behavior, we track um, somewhere between 30 and 35 different data points across the three data sets um, we're gonna go into in a second, but across those three subsets, um, but we don't express directly uh, which exact data streams we're collecting. We don't express the ratio of them um, when we, you know, partner with projects, et cetera, we never disclose uh, those types of You know, hey, if I commit more code, is my score going to go up? Um, that won't do it. Um, that's probably the easiest thing you can gain. Um, you, there are a lot of factors we see between these things uh, to, to understand whether there might be gaming that are, that are happening. So. Right. I will add to that, um, aside from being diligent about our methodology, we do also regularly audit our own scores. So we're constantly going through and making sure that spikes that we're seeing um, appear to be legitimate and not the result of someone gaming things. Um, we so we so we have um, you know outlier detection flagging that helps us look for those jumps and and confirm or deny that they're legit. Um, and then from a modeling perspective, we do. Uh, we do have a layer on top of the scoring system that, I, that identifies partitions of projects that tend to behave similarly. And we look at how that relates to um, both you know, market statistics like market cap and price, as well as the other components of FCAS to look for where we have extreme mismatches, like a project that has extremely high developer activity but has no trading or, or, or you know, any market maturity evidence, um, we would be suspicious about that. So we do have mechanisms where we can go in and look for um, the rare instance where projects are potentially trying to game our score. Got it. Okay. So, and then there was a question about when does it make sense to look at developer activity? So we do, we do, yeah, okay. Um, 
in terms of I, I'm not positive about the implication there. Like I, we would argue it always makes sense to look at it. Um, perhaps there are occasional rare exceptions where developer activity is less important. Again, I would uh, point to that we're using uh, a, a sort of variable weight on all of our scores depending on the partition that a, a given project falls into. So if you're you know, purely a smart contract that's part of some other bigger system that doesn't really need ongoing development work, then the weight for that project will focus more on user But that, that is a rare exception. I would say for the vast majority of projects, developer activity is extremely important. Okay, should we keep moving or Casey, are there other questions? Yeah, we have a bunch of questions, but I'm gonna save them for the, later in the webinar. Let's keep moving on okay. for now. Okay, if there are hard ones, you can just forget those. We'll just take the easy ones. Kidding, kidding. Okay, <laughs> ask, us, ask us the hard questions. Ask us the hard ones. Okay, so so <clears throat> what, what you're looking at here is what the way this business runs when we, um, after our scores are published, uh, uh, our, our really number one goal is to help crypto projects and organizations become companies and become businesses and grow. We have a strong interest in making sure this whole industry continues to thrive and the way to do that is, is to ensure some of these companies really succeed. So one thing we do is we provide a dashboard of free analytics for any crypto project uh, who is rated. Um, so you're looking at one here for, for AE, um, uh, Eternity. Uh, this is current. So if you were Eternity and you wanted to understand your FCAS, you would have access to this dashboard. We do not give this dashboard out to other projects uh, or, or competitors, as an example. So like this is a good view for you uh, to see, see here. Uh, Eternity is not a client, so I can show you this for the, for the short term. Uh, but if they were a client, we wouldn't share this. Um, so just showing you what's happening here, um, their current FCAS is 811. Um, you can see here, this is the overall zero to 1,000 FCAS distribution. One thing you'll note are these gray uh, boxes or rectangles. These are actually all assets we rate. And so you'll, you'll note here, there's no, nothing in the 1,000 range. Um, uh, so, so 811 is even a little bit more than maybe it appears when you're, when you're looking at it. It's a pretty strong score. Developer behavior, very high right now. And if you've noticed, you can see something's been happening here with Eternity. We thought this would be a good one to show because of this. Over the early part of the year, their developer behavior has been trailing off. The blue line, uh, if I do this, the blue line is their current rating, and the green is their 30-day moving average. And so you can see here something happened. Um, their user activity hasn't been changing much, and their market maturity hasn't either. So we might dive in a bit here to see what's happening. Here's their developer behavior and what's going into it. All three categories, code contribution, community involvement, and code improvements are lifting, um, and lifting dramatically. You can see it better here. Um, so um, if you actually went to their GitHub uh, uh, repo online, you would actually see a whole bunch of things that had been quiet or closed uh, suddenly opened up. and so. Something's happening. I would tell you, uh, we don't know what. The, well, you know. We, we think we know what. Uh, okay. We think it's probably related to ramped up work on their wallet extension that they've been working on in their, and the voting mechanism that's been uh, ramped up lately. Right. So, so, right. So, as part of auditing this kind of spike, we look for whether there's a reason for the, that, that satisfies whether there could be a spike or if it's, again, potentially an aberration. That's right. So, that's interesting here. Probably more interesting for for us uh, holistically as well. They're doing good work developer-wise, but these two trends here, which are the subcomponents of user activity, are really the important things to maybe think about as a business. Network activity. So this is all activity of uh, everything that's happening within their network. Minor activity, investors, users just everything that's happening. Okay, you know, it's a little bit bumpy, but you can see the trend is pretty stable. It's, it's not bad, it's a 700 range, that's pretty good. This is the one I would worry the most about. These are actual users, so we're removing all speculation, all other types of activities. This is user behavior. Now, the user behavior has not been evolving much. That may not be uh, a bad thing for the moment um, as a signal 
oftentimes when a development community starts to grow as quickly as it has, maybe there's product releases coming and that may mean user behavior will eventually start to show the change, but it hasn't yet. So we would pay attention to that closely. And then just so you can see it, um, here's their market maturity. Um, again, pretty stable. Their liquidity actually has gone up recently. So that means there's more, more to trade on. Uh, so that's good. That's impacting their rating. Again, market maturity is less than 5% of that cast. Okay. I'm going to show you a couple other things we do for projects here. Um, so you can see the types of data we can start to get into. Um, so this is a view into um, Zcash. So this is what we call a sector analysis. Um, the dials at the top are Zcash's scores. Um, Zcash has not influenced this. This is a, a mock-up for you. Uh, the data is real, but it's a mock-up for you. Um, you can see um, their sector is at the bottom here, and you can see it includes things you might expect, Dash, um, Monero, uh, Particle, Enigma, things like that. So at the top, you've got their yellow and, and the blue um, half circles are their, are their sector. So, you know, they're generally doing better than their sector in most metrics, a little light market maturity, but nothing significant. Um, if you got into the data, you would see some interesting things and user activity for Dash, um, they're, they're actually doing quite well. They're in an 877. So right now they're performing better as user activity than, um, uh, than Zcash is itself. Um, if you looked at Enigma's trend over the past six months, they've grown their ratings by 18, 19%. Um, so something's happening within Enigma. So as a project, uh, getting a view into this type of data can be incredibly useful. How am I, I need some comparatives. How am I doing, how am I doing next to my peers? Um, maybe even how am I doing next to people I would like to, you know, I would like to become, right? Um, everyone wants to know how they are next to a Bitcoin or Ethereum or something like that. So how am I, how am I doing? next to a standard. So this is a sector analysis. This is an add-on tool to our analytic suites. Um, the next thing, I'll, I'll let Eric dive in on this, but um, the sort of lead-in is, you know, if you're going to be a business, um, the thing you can do is start to understand your customers. And by removing all speculation from our analyses, we can see a pretty interesting insight into how customers might be behaving. I'm going to show you this. Chart here. Great. Thanks, Dave. This is Eric again. So this plot highlights one really cool thing we can do by isolating the uh, the view to the wallets that have been tagged as user wallets. So this is for an ERC20 token that we've scrubbed the name of because they're a client, so we can't talk about who exactly it is. But we can look at the idea here and see that what we've done is identify cohorts based on the first month that they were active as a user, and then look at each subsequent month and catalog whether every user um, engaged with this project more than the previous month, less than the previous month, or about the same as the previous month became dormant, that is just their tokens are sitting around on their wallet, or departed the system entirely, that is sold all of their tokens and now that wallet is empty. So. Uh, there are a couple of things to highlight for this for this project. Um, one is that we're able to, you can see the white line is, is representative of their sector average. So they're actually, and, and this is the, the sector average for departed because they're particularly concerned about the percentage of wallets that are departing their system after only a couple of months. And they wanted to see what the average was for the sector. So we're able to, to tease that out based on similar projects and tokens um, and show them that, give them that answer, right? So, so something they want to be monitoring as their project evolves is whether they're able to engage their users more over time and reduce that uh, that departed percentage. So, hopefully, this this makes sense. It should. I mean, it's it's a it's a clear plot, but it highlights the very difficult task of isolating those user wallets. This is a much less informative plot if it's of every wallet on a system. Right. Just one other thing to, to point out here, um, as a company, if you're releasing product, um, you can see some interesting patterns. They release product in month one, and so you have a large purple band, so there's people trying it, and then those people are sort of slipping off over time. 
And then the yellow increased a tiny bit. So some of those people went into low usage, but most of them went into that dormant or departed. And so the reality here is whatever product was launched eight months ago probably didn't have the intended effect. And so what the, the result is, as you're releasing product, as you're beginning to do different things with your tool set, you can begin to track exactly whether it's having an impact on how your users are behaving and whether there are certain types of, of things you should do to activate or reactivate dormant users and folks like that. Okay. Guys, just to quickly interrupt, I think it would be helpful yeah. if you could share a bit about the profile of your, your customers and clients. Like, who is using this information? Um, what, what exactly is the business model? There's a few people asking, and, and I figured you could give a quick answer. Right. Every, every company needs customers and revenue. We said that, didn't we? We did say that. <laughs> um, so um, so I, I will, uh, I'm just going to blow this up a bit. It's too much. So what we do as a business is this tool, I'll just go back to this one, it's probably easier. This tool is, is free at the outset for customers, for projects, um, but the sector analysis, the first one I showed you for Zcash, um, that is a monthly fee. Um, so for a project that wants to start to move into more detailed understanding of how, they can, how they're working next to others, and then there is a premium module, which is that cohort analysis, which has a different monthly fee associated with it. So we're basically selling enterprise level project tool and analytics tools to projects um, with a premium offering up front and then a suite of services on the back end uh, based on uh, how sophisticated they're, they're intending to get with their customers. Great. Okay. And what's your... What's your view on the potential conflicts of interest for taking on crypto projects as clients? Well, a conflict for interest in, in what way exactly? Uh, well, what, um, maybe let, I'm, I'm going to try to answer. It was a general question, but I think that you can you can kind of dispel it um, based okay. off of. Okay. 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 Um, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, so, so in the history of ratings agencies, there have been some other organizations that have, you know, hey, if you if you hire us, you know, maybe we can help your rating better. Um, we have pretty strong ethical standards here. We actually have a customer now uh, who um, who hired us and then um, kept asking us to to get deeper and deeper into exactly how the developer rating was rated. Their developer score was okay, but Oh, you know, tell me the 30 things you track. Tell me which ones are weighted which, which. And so we, we just said we can't. That's not what we do. And we need to protect that information so that it can't be adapted unethically. Um, that customer is frustrated and unhappy. Um, but, you know, we aren't going to go say, oh, I, we see what you're trying to do. Let's change your score. Or we're going to tell you how to change your score because that's, that limits the point of the whole exercise. Now we do provide modules to help them understand uh, things they, they, that seem to be failing on them from uh, broader categories, much like seeing some of this type of information or sector stuff. But we won't ever get paid in order to change a rating uh, or, um, or help people see how they can change it uh, unfairly to the rest of the market. Okay. Super helpful. And for those of you who are asking about um, how this can be used for investment funds, I believe that in the next phase of, of the presentation, we're going to talk about a couple of different full, uh, types of tools and offerings. Um, so just give us your patience and, and we'll get to your question shortly. We're, we're here right now, actually, Casey. It was, it was a, a perfect lead in. So um, for the investors in the room, um, I will tell you that, that Flipside began as an investment organization. Um, we, we kicked off very accidentally by actually um, Jim, the technical co-founder, and I wanting to trade crypto and asking our good friend Eric here uh, if he would let us borrow his old swing trading algorithm for hedge funds to trade. And he, he did, which took about six weeks of rebuilding it using crypto historicals and then providing us more and more data. And we began trading. We began trading for other people. We raised about a 10 million principal um, uh, fund and we 
traded. And we use this rating system in order to understand how to how to um, how to trade effectively, um, building off a fundamental model. Um, we over time, pretty quickly, we decided the, the this information and what we really are as entrepreneurs, we're more strongly invested in helping projects grow. And so we began moving in that direction uh, and instead sort of really focused on moving over there. What we, but because we had that fund operating, we had built a series of tools for investors. We, they were actually a series of tools for us. And so we decided that one thing we would do as we moved to the, um, to the uh, projects is we would begin to give away those tools for free, okay? So if you if we're going to show you how to get to these for free, this is something called FCAS Tracker. This is a tool we use to run our own fund. Um, and what you can see here is on the first tab, you can see a bunch of coins, their current FCAS rating, their subscore ratings, and then their changes in FCAS ratings over time. So you can see here um, their subscores and developer activity, their user activity, et cetera. We even have some fun. Uh, sort of plotting here so you can see how do all these things sort of rate next to each other. Um, and then in tab two, um, we have the ability to go deep on a coin. So we were talking about AD a second ago. So if we do that, we can load into Eternity. And now you can see Eternity's FCAS uh, rating over time, okay? And some of its changes. And I'm gonna just reduce my screen a bit here. Think. Is that what's happening? <laughs> um, it also gives you the ability to plot out um, all the data that is, is on these charts. So you can actually see here um, what's been happening. Um, here's that, these spikes that are happening in, in FCAS, et cetera, going on over here, okay? So you're, you're able to, as an investor, get free access to this tool. Um, we do have some other things that can go along with that. Um, we have right now you can talk to an analyst because some of the stuff you want to understand how it's working and we're more than happy to have a chat with you about that. Um, we also have an uh, email list called the Daily Mover. Um, if you sign up on our site every day, we release information on um, one, uh, one asset and what might be changing its, its, uh, its scores over time. Okay. So um, right at the top here, upper left, you can see the URL if you want to go fill that out that submits you into the queue to get a FCAS tracker set up for you and we will, we will provide that for you. Okay, does that answer, uh, answer investor questions or are there others? Yes, it does, um, but it's funny. As I was looking at the changes that happen over time um, with an individual project, it, it kind of brought up a question that was asked earlier in the webinar um, which was from our friend Garrick over at, at Blockchain. Uh, he was asking if the weighting for code changes, code improvement, community involvement across all of the projects um, are standard or if they're varied project by project. And then he had asked um, a kind of more specific question to the changes that we see over time, which is that, are you taking account for the fact that more mature projects may have fewer code changes? And I guess, how are you thinking about the maturity of a project um, when it comes to weighting their scores. Right, so, yes. so we could go pretty deep on that question, but um, I will say we are considerate of the, of the maturity questions. We do see actually that um, mature projects scores shift from you know, lots of initial code changes when they're fresh and new to a bigger community and more people watching their code repositories and more bug reports as new features come out over time. So, um, you know, it, it's it's almost not even correct to say that inherently there's less need for developer activity as a project grows to be more mature. If it's in fact getting more users and adding features, then ongoing development is necessary. And we see that on a lot of the successful mature projects. Um, the the other question about like a, it, it's hard for us to answer direct questions about exactly what our weightings are. Um, we are very careful about how we derive those ratings. We try to you know as with the score system itself, we use a quantitative approach when possible. So we're not just saying like code changes is 50%. We are using um, you know a combination of 
looking at covariance over time and those cohorts or clusters of projects that I mentioned earlier to derive those weights. Um, beyond that, I don't want to get into exactly what those weights are um, because we are we want to be careful about potentially tipping people off on how to game our scores. Totally understandable. Thanks for even taking the question. I know that we're coming in with, with some uh, some not so easy questions from the audience, which to me says that awesome. this is a really exciting and engaging topic. Um, yeah. Do you guys want to continue or should we pause for some more questions? Um, we have we have one more set of slides, two more sets of slides to go through, but we, we're happy to take questions. Let's go where people want to go. Well, how about this? Let's keep moving forward and I'll just continue to kind of work things in as we go. Okay, so we're going to show you one other fun little little module here. This is called Money Supply Bands. And so for the, this will be to the investors as well. Uh, here we are. Okay, so I'm going to let Eric talk through this, but one thing we do as we begin tracking this data is we can start to see what's happening with the money supply bands within specific assets. So for investors, um, um, some projects are in the finance space, and so they might need this data to understand uh, how assets are, how the volume and volatility of assets are occurring and, and what might be changing. So this is a view into money supply bands. I'm going to dig in and then let, let uh, Eric walk you through what's happening here. Right. So right, this is, this is an example of something we can do because we have a clean history of the entire um, you know, you can say the entire history in this case of Bitcoin, of all transactions and balances over the entire history that you know Bitcoin has existed. So that has allowed us to build a framework where we can assign every, in this case, it's every coin that's in the supply um, to one of uh, six bands, right? So we have some anything that's freshly minted in the last week, anything that's been active in the last week, um, one week to one month, one week to one month to six months, six months to two and a half years, and then what we call stagnant is uh, anything that's been sitting there for more than two and a half years. Um, so Dave has zoomed in helpfully to a couple of interesting um, recent shifts that have occurred in these supply bands, and, and they both illustrate different things that can occur if you're monitoring this kind of data. So what happened in um, sort of October into November um, at the end of 2018, was one of the biggest shifts we've seen actually out of stagnant um, and uh, and FS1 bands and into active. And because this is coins, you don't actually get the view here of, of who is or what wallets are responsible for these shifts. So when we dug in on this particular jump into active, we saw that it was only really one or two exchange operated wallets that were responsible for this jump. And then we saw actually a subsequent cliff that Bitcoin went off um, uh, over the course of this month. Yeah. That contrasts with, this, with the shift that we saw recently in March, which corresponded to a, a, a pretty significant rise in the price of Bitcoin. Um, we saw actually that a lot more wallets were responsible for this shift from, um, from sort of FS2 into FS1, uh, sorry, into FS4. Um, so, you know, a lot more wallets participating in that, a lot more people perhaps getting back into Bitcoin. Yeah. So that's a fun one for investors um, and we and for projects who are in, in, the, uh, in the finance space. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to leave you with is um, a little bit of a story about how you might want to think about fundamentals. So um, if you were sort of like me in this, in operating in this space in 2018, as prices were falling, everybody would say to me, oh, yeah, you know, you're in the crypto space. Is the like, the industry's over? Like, what's happening? God, how do you feel? You know, it must be ending here. You know, this must be terrible. Uh, to which I, you know, I I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, it's not a, it's not the most fun of times, but what we see is maybe a tiny bit different. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the story here. Um, we track something called the FCAS 25, which tracks the overall health of the industry um, through fundamentals. Um, you can find this on our site um, at the URL at the bottom. Um, this is live at all times, and so this will will share with you what the health looks like. So to read this, um, take a look at a couple things. The red band, which pro which is the closest representation to speculation, as you'd expect, it increased at the end of 2017, then declined through most of 2018, 
And you're actually seeing it now start to rise a tiny bit again as prices are moving. So that makes sense. Um, developer behavior, uh, you can see here in the green, remarkably consistent over all of 2018. Uh, it was gradually increasing over the last two years. People are continuing to build. And then uh, the yellow is really the most interesting story as you sort of headed into 2018, increasing. And then over, over most of 2018, you saw this continuing to grow. So more projects have more customers being added and continuing to use their, their uh, tools over the course of the time when prices were declining. Okay, and so what we see this and we talk a lot about is the actual health of the industry is just fine. Um, prices may be, for investors, they may be rocky if you're betting on, on speculation, but the truth is that all the data shows that this industry is far from faltering. As a matter of fact, it's been, it's been humming along, it's growing quite well, and every indication we have is that the, uh, the best is yet to come. Okay, so that's all we had for you today. Maybe we'll take some, I know we have a few minutes, some final questions if people have them. Um, happy to talk about anything. Awesome, thank you guys so much. I'm uh, scrolling back through questions, seeing which ones we might wanna pull out here. Um, let's see. So a question from Sid. He said, thanks, this is really interesting. Um, I was wondering how do you label addresses? Do you gather labels externally apart from clustering, classification, and all models? Um, is that something that you guys can answer? Did you hear the first? One? I believe the question is basically where are we getting our ground truth for address and transaction labels? Is that about right? Exactly. Better worded than myself. <laughs> right. Um, so without commenting on exactly where we're getting them, we uh, we build most of it ourselves and then we use some third parties, you probably have some in mind and you're probably right, uh, to confirm, you either you know, confirm or deny what our models are telling us. Um, and then we've we've got a couple of partnerships with a couple of providers of that kind of data as well. So that's about what we'll say about that. <laughs> Great. And can you elaborate on how you're using machine learning? Um, interesting. Um, I think from a, I'll, I'll go from a, from a sort of uh, technical perspective. The my my belief about machine learning is that it's um, a, a hugely important, valuable uh, part of being an effective data scientist. Um, I think. I have seen a trend in recent data scientists who rely on machine learning approaches almost entirely to answer every question there is to answer, um, to sort of shortcut things and avoid doing difficult exploratory analyses. Um, and so at least my personal bias is that when you can do something with a straightforward statistical frequentist or Bayesian approach, um, I, I like to do that and then augment with machine learning approach. That's not to say that we don't use machine learning or that I don't use it or that I think it's stupid. I think it's awesome. Um, but that's that's sort of my order of operations. A fair answer. Um, and another question that was from much earlier in the presentation, just around the source of the data, is this public? Um, and how are you ensuring that the, the data is accurate that you're working with? Um, that's a, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Um, the data being accurate, um, so we take it from, you know, either the chain itself or open source repositories. Um, in the event, there are many cases actually where uh, projects will give us access to their private code repositories. We have some tools that let us uh, extract metadata without seeing code in private repositories. So I'd say we, we actually get a quite a deeper look uh, than, than most. We actually have tools uh, for uh, projects that have, are built on separate or distinct forks of chains. Um, we have tools that allow them to decode their blocks for us so that we can actually label and do all the things we intend to do uh, with all the information that um, is possible 
uh, from the people who build build that tool. Um, so like we're, you know, we spend our days uh, vetting all of that data. Um, we have use cases where um, people want to provide us off-chain data that we can't verify or audit, and um, we don't take it. I mean, that's just plain and simple. We're very careful about what we're willing to put into our system or not. I think I'll add quickly, too, that part of the, the daily task of our data engineering team is to constantly be circling back through all of our code to look for cockroaches and, and ensure that we remove those. You know, any code base has bugs and like the crypto projects that we're tracking, we're doing a lot of work to improve those things and identify them. So, you know, that's, we, we don't assume that all of our data is perfect um, and we clean it fastidiously all the time. Right. So you can get a quick snapshot of just some of the things where we do to, to help clean that from, from below here. Awesome. Um, another question here is, is a bit higher level. Um, as you had envisioned FCAS for an investor, what did you intend for this to measure? Were you thinking that you wanted to measure you know, the risk of it going to zero, the overall quality of the project? Um, yeah, just talk a little bit about the original vision. Yeah, so for us, when we were using FCAS as an investment um, metric, um, it was really to see beyond the hype, uh, the ability to sort of, you know, um, you know, manipulate a coin through sentiment or, you know, uh, telegram or whatever, whatever the models were, you know, uh, to, to push things. So what we were actually looking for was a long term view into which assets were healthiest, the, the sort of we take a public company philosophy, um, you know, the, the ones that, you know, you know, sort of maybe Warren Buffettish. You know, the ones that show the true, you know, fundamental metrics around growth. You know, may not pay off in the short run, but no question, they're going to win in the long run. And so we were using Fcast to try to tease out which of these companies, and I use that word word uh, uh, very clearly, were actually building businesses, um, because we believed. You know, we might miss a, you know, a moon or, you know, something that was crazy that would happen on a, on a price, but we would, we would definitely catch the ones that were stronger. Now, what we found was through certain elements of FCAS, some of the subcomponents, you could actually predict short-term price movement in some ways. And FCAS overall was a very strong metric for seeing longer-term uh, changes in an asset's uh, uh, valuation. So we, we, we got a little of both. Um, but you know, it's how you use the tool, like anything, that that makes um, the most sense. Great. And there's a few more coming in under the line. How do you guys feel? Do you want to take one more question, or should we should we stop right on time at at a minute past two? We'll we'll do we'll do one last question. Let's make it a good one. Let's make it a good one. Let's do. Let's finish. Let's finish high. All right, all right, all right, the pressure's on. I'm reading through all these. Hold on one second. Okay, so we have a question from someone um, who's working on the project currently. I don't know whether or not I have permission to use the name, so I won't throw it out there. Um, but they said that, um, let's see. Very interesting to see. So, so in the circumstance that someone has a very low score, um, can, can you talk a little bit about what the what the process is for addressing that um, yeah. and talk about how you dig into when a score changes uh, drastically over a short period of time? Okay, I think I think I think well the first part I think is is easy. The second one I, I may I may have heard, but let me let me do the first one first. So um, we often do get called by projects that have low ratings. Um, and so what we do is um, we the first step with them is to, uh, if they'd like, we're happy to do a consult with them about what we're seeing in their data. And we're happy to set them up with their dashboard um, at no charge. So um, they can access all the information about their own score once they validate that they're with that organization. Um, we then work through a few different areas where we might be able to 
uh, better uh, maybe impact their score with more effective data. For example, if they have a private code repository, we, we help connect to that for them so that that is better reflected. If they have, um, you know, if they have, if they're off on a different chain than we want them when we've already um, decoded, we will provide them the tools to allow them to uh, get that decoded for us so that we can uh, help them see their user activity score more clearly. So we will do a few things for them. Um, again, all those no charge just to just to help get the right data in there. If if the data is still uh, not you know uh, significant or doesn't reflect a strong rating, um, that's when we can uh, begin discussions around some of the other tools that help them understand. Um, what's happening with their users or what's happening with their developer communities, um, you know, whether, you know, maybe maybe they're unhappy with their rating, but in their sector, uh, everybody is rated poorly because there are no customers, for example. And so, um, you know, there's just a variety of things we can do, we can do there. And I just want to ask one more question from you guys, because you are the keepers of so much data, you are, have so many insights that you're pulling from this. What data set do you think has a better signal than most people think or give credit to? Like what's one data set that you think no one's really paying attention to, but that can be a really strong signal? I hate, I, I have been coached to never give investment advice. <laughs> so I'm not gonna answer that. I would just say, spend less time in Telegram channels and more time looking at the fundamentals. You'll, you'll see signals that, that are that are uh, more longer term indicative than, uh, than than trying to catch fire. I love that. That's a perfect answer uh, to close on and, and very, very well navigated. So, so kudos there. Um, guys, the informative. Uh, thank you, Dave. And thank you, Eric, for taking the time to put together such a thoughtful and comprehensive presentation and for giving us a, a, a bit of a demo in there as well. Um, for those who are still on the line, we're going to be posting a recording of this to the DCG YouTube channel later this afternoon uh, at the latest first thing tomorrow. And so we'll encourage anyone who found value from this to tweet it out, share it with their network so that more people can learn about what Flipside Crypto is working on. Um, and guys, should anyone have other follow-up questions, um, where should they get in touch with you? So there are, we have a wonderful website where there are about a thousand different boxes you can fill in to reach us. Um, but certainly you can email me at any time, Dave at Flipside Crypto. Um, Eric is Eric at FlipsideCrypto.com. And, uh, you know, you, you can, it, it's easy to find us. We do not make it hard. Let's put it that way. <laughs>